Good morning. Welcome to Amazing Grace Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Luke Italiano. Last several weeks, we've been talking about reasons to hate Jesus. Uh, last week, we saw that sometimes we hate him because he forgives. Sometimes we hate him because it's not about church, it's about him. Today, we're going to see that another reason to hate Jesus is that, um, is that I've just gapped out what our service is about today, is that he demands love, that it's not about following rules. It's not about the outside, but about the inside. And that can be really frustrating. How do we respond when Jesus demands this? Well, we'll talk about it today. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God doesn't tell us to just do the right things on the outside. He demands that our motivation for doing the right things is love. Love for him first, love for our neighbor second. And I don't know about you, but I'm guessing that even if we do things that are okay on the outside, we're not always motivated by love. We're motivated by making our lives easier. Or we're motivated by, I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to look bad. Anytime we fail to love, we sin. We silently confess our sins, whether it's this sin or another sin that's brought us guilt this week. As baptized children of God, we confess our sins. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us. He's given his only son to be the atoning sacrifice for all of our sins. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent Jesus to die for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you reveal to us that you are love. Love prompted you to become our brother and scorn the shame of the cross. Help us to rejoice in your love and show that same love to one another. For you reign in heaven with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, amen. In our lessons today, we're going to hear a lot about love. And in our first lesson, we hear that God commanded love even from the very beginning. Our first lesson is from Leviticus chapter 19. God said, do not hate your brother in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so that you will not share in his guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is God's word. Now, so often we have failed to love, and so in our psalm today, we get to pray for a new heart. Let's join together in speaking responsively, select verses from Psalm 51. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation 
and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our second lesson is a chapter that you may have heard before. It's called the Great Love Chapter from the Bible. Here now, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they'll cease. Where there are tongues, they'll be stilled. Where there's knowledge, it'll pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but, but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I'm fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. This is God's word. Let's speak our confession of faith Today, we use the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The part of God's word we're going to focus on today comes from Mark chapter 3. There the Bible says, Another time Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath to do? To do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? But they remained silent. Jesus looked around at them in anger and, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, 
and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. This is God's word. When was the last time you used the rules as an excuse to not love? Okay, so you probably didn't phrase it that way. But we do this. Humans are really good at it. Christians can get picked on a lot for this, that we use rules as an excuse to not show someone love. It it might show up like this. The Bible says that it's wrong to practice homosexuality, and you just came out of the closet, so I don't have to love you anymore. Or, Or maybe it comes out like this. The Bible says that abortion is wrong, and you voted for a pro-choice candidate. I can't, you can't be part of this family anymore. Or maybe it shows up like this. The Bible says you're supposed to love, and you have been so judgmental, and that means I'm not going to love you anymore. See, what happens is when someone breaks a rule, and usually a rule that we particularly like, we use that as, as an excuse to say, I don't have to love you anymore. You you broke that rule, and now I don't want to love you. And then here comes Jesus. And Jesus says, no, no, no. Love the Lord your God first, and love your neighbor as yourself. And we hear that, and we go, "Ah, you don't mean that guy, do you? And Jesus goes, yeah, that guy too. And we don't like it. And in fact, it's another reason to hate Jesus. You see, Jesus was really well known for for teaching this, for for loving the people that broke the rules. He was really well known for healing and showing love to people, even though they didn't deserve it. We've already heard how Jesus was really getting under the skin of the religious leaders. He was forgiving people like he was God. He was making it about Jesus, about God, and not about just going to church. And, And there were all of these things that were getting under their skin And they were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus so that they could at least knock him down a few pegs. And so they set up a trap. They tried to get Jesus to do work on the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath was a weekly day. It was Saturday. And God had actually laid out this rule for the Old Testament. We're not under this rule anymore. But God said on the Sabbath, you are to rest all day long. That was a really good rule. I mean, can you imagine having an entire day every week to rest? I don't mean a day where you don't go and get paid work done, because I don't know about you, but the day that I take off is the day that I use to catch up on all the stuff I didn't do during the week. It's not really restful a lot of the time. But God said, no, no, one day a week, I've got this. You can trust me. Your job is to do nothing. And God used that to to build trust in his people. But what had happened over time was that people started asking, well, God says to rest. What's rest really? And they started putting together all these rules to try and define what rest was. I mean, it got to the point that they were told, if you walk this many steps, that's restful. One more step and that's work and that's wrong. And these leaders, these religious leaders that really valued these rules said, well, you can't heal on the Sabbath, because clearly that's work. I mean, really, you you can wait. And so what they did is that they put a man in the synagogue where Jesus was teaching. This man had a withered hand. Now, we don't know exactly what happened. The Bible doesn't usually use modern medical terms. Was it some sort of birth defect? Was it a, a degenerative muscle disease? We don't know. But he had a withered hand. There was something wrong with his hand. And Jesus saw this guy, and he took the bait. Jesus was going to heal this guy. And what's interesting is that Jesus didn't have to do that. We know from earlier in the book of Mark that Jesus had actually waited before, that he had said, I'm going to heal after the Sabbath. He'd done this before. And this man's life was not in danger. If he waited just a few more hours to the end of the Sabbath, he would have been fine. But instead of waiting, Jesus uses this as an opportunity to confront the leaders. 
And so Jesus says to the guy with the shriveled hand, come on up, stand in front of everyone. And so everyone's looking at him, and Jesus asks, what do you guys think? What's the right thing to do? On the Sabbath, should we do good or evil? Should we kill or should we bring life? What do you think? And the second Jesus says that, the religious leaders know that they've been pinned to the wall. Because it's not about work or not work. Now Jesus is saying, is it right to do the right thing or the wrong thing? And they don't want to answer because they want Jesus to do the wrong thing. And Jesus' response is fascinating. First off, he was angry. He was angry that these people were so focused on rules that they weren't loving. He was so angry at them that because of their focus on rules, they were causing hardship and harm to other people. But it's interesting because Jesus also felt compassion, not just for the guy with the withered hand, but for the religious leaders. His heart went out to them because When Jesus came to die for the sins of the world, he came to die for their sins too. And he hurt for them. He wanted to gather them together like a a mother hen, like a mother hen gathers its chicks under its wings. But they weren't willing. And so Jesus says to the man with the withered hand, go ahead, stretch out your hand. And like that, the ligaments and the tendons and everything works. It is an amazing miracle. Jesus does good. But the religious leaders, they got even more angry because Jesus had rubbed their noses in it. He had gotten out of it. And so the religious leaders, they go out and they plan not to just knock him down a few pegs, but to destroy him. Now they're looking for a reason to kill him. Now, the thing that we're addressing today is something that Christians really do struggle with. And we usually go off the road onto ditches on either side. And depending which of God's laws we're talking about, maybe you go off on both sides. Some people hear God's rules and they say, ah, but we're supposed to love. And they use that love as an excuse to ignore what God says. Well, I know that what you're doing is wrong according to the Ten Commandments, but you know, I love you so much, so I'm just going to let you do that, and I'm sure it's fine. And what those people are doing is that they're refusing to love God. We're refusing to love what God says, and that's wrong. God never says, love and ignore what I say. But then you get the other side that says, no, God gave these commandments, and that means I'm going to follow them and I'm not going to love. I'm just going to do what the rules say. And that's just as bad. And in fact, in some ways, it's actually worse. Because what you're saying is, I will not love you if you break the rules. And if you're known as a Christian, and I pray that you are, what you're teaching is, God will not love you unless you follow the rules. And that's wrong. The Bible says it very clearly. While we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. I I quoted the verse in the absolution when I announced forgiveness earlier this morning. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave himself up for us. And what happens is that we get so fixated on the rules that we forget to love. Or we get so fixated on love that we forget what God says. And either way, we're marching off what God has laid out for us, and we're sinning. This is the simple truth. If we love, we're obeying God's commandments. And if we're obeying God's commandments, we're loving. If I'm refusing to love, I'm breaking God's commandments. And if I'm refusing to follow God's commandments, I'm refusing to love. So what do we do? We confess our sin. We confess our refusal to love. We confess our refusal to listen to what God commands. And we see Jesus, who never saw a conflict. 
See, so often we, we look at love and commandments and, and they look like they fight against each other. But Jesus looks at them and says, it's the same thing. And he did it. He loved people who were sinners. People like me and people like you. And he didn't shy away from God's commandments. He kept them all while he was loving the people around him. And when he died, he died for you. So for every time you fail to love, Jesus loved you and took your sins away. Yeah, even when we sin, even when we refuse to love, he loves us and he forgives us. And so it's not about following rules and ignoring love. And it's not about love and ignoring the rules. Because the more we get to know Jesus, the more that we see that what he commands is good. Kind of like what I said about that rule about resting. It's good. And I want to love you when you break the rules. Now that love may take the form of saying what you're doing is wrong. I love you, even though you're doing the wrong thing. And maybe that person will not appreciate that message. And it may be that I'm going to love you and I'm going to look for an opportunity to share Jesus with you. But it's going to be about love because God loved me so much and he loves you just as much. Why wouldn't I love you? And what happens is that we start loving everything God has said and we start loving everyone that God has made. Yeah, even when they sin. Because God loves us when we sin and he forgives us. And so when we hear that it's about love, it's not a reason to hate Jesus anymore, but a reason to praise him. Because God loves sinners like us. Amen. We're going to continue now by reviewing our catechism, assuming my phone turns back on. Um, And this catechism, we're going to review the third commandment, which is the one that they fixated on the rules of. And we're going to see here that in the meaning that it's not about following the rule, but about loving. And if we love, we're going to be doing it anyways. Let's review the third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not despise preaching and his word, but regard it as holy and gladly hear and learn it. All right, y'all, it is time for prayer. Um, I've not yet received any prayer requests. So if you have any prayer requests, please put them into chat or text me. Uh, Chat is more reliable, but you can use either. All right. Um, Tom and Patty Radink are members. They are coming home from Florida today. So we will pray for a safe trip home. I think that's a good prayer. Um, I have not received any others. If any others come in and I see them, I will add them into our prayers. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you loved us and you gave yourself up for us, even though we're sinners. Cover us in your love and your forgiveness. Help us to rejoice in who you are. Move us to love the people around us, not ignoring what you say, but loving what you say and loving the people around us. Give us wisdom to figure out how to do that best. It's not always easy to figure that out. Fill us with love. And when we fail, forgive us. Lord, you've blessed us to be in an era where we can travel. Be with those who are traveling this weekend. Guide them and protect them as they get to their destinations. We ask especially that you be with Tom and Patty as they come home. Thank you for the time that you've given them a restful time away and protect them until they are restored to us here. We pray all this in your name. Amen. I invite you to pray with me the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Lord, look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.